Hi everyone, how's it going? Team here, and this is episode seven of Building Data Science with JavaScript. This is going to be our final episode, and uh, today we're going to talk about creating the REST interface and the user interface for our data science project. So uh, for REST interface, I have uh, picked um, Festify as an example uh, framework that we could use. I, you know, I wanted to play around with it. I haven't used it, but um, the API turned out to be pretty similar to what um, Express.js, for example, does with some slight differences. I mean, Festify is, I mean, it's been quite enjoyable to do. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't support the uh, sync await syntax completely. So it does support it for roots, but you cannot do this for, for example, register or listen. The setup itself is quite sim simple. So we have the connection to our MongoDB. The connection is read only. So because our storage service does all the writes, in this case, we're gonna be only reading. I we're not going to be doing anything directly because this might uh, cause problems essentially because we only have to have one writer in sort of microservice worlds, right? And it's going to be storage service, which will handle all the writes. In this case, it's quite simple. So in the roots, uh, again, I kept it simple. So we have this array of roots, which I use the register function from Festify to register. And uh, we have a bunch of uh, like just the three essentially uh, functions here. The home is just hello world to test that it's working, you know, very simple. Uh, the API, as you can see, is very similar to that of Express. Um, then we have uh, Find Game. So this is just a wrapper around the uh, Open Critic Search API because we need some way to get uh, to find the game and basically present it to user. Then we got the Process Game, which actually could be removed because I've integrated it into Game.js itself. And uh, the Game.js um, itself works in a pretty simple way. So basically, you send a request with Game ID here. Um, um, we execute the request to MongoDB asking, hey, do you have any articles? Um, and we limit it by uh, basically fields that we want to have because we don't really want to have the whole document since it can be quite large, specifically because of the text and HTML that it includes, right? So we limit the set of fields that we want to get back to limit the size of the results. And here's what we're going to do. Um, if the articles, if there is something in the database, we send it back and say the status is complete, we're done. If not, we're going to send a request to RabbitMQ to OpenCritic with the ID and say, hey, here's an ID of the game I want you to process. So um, I also had to modify the Open Critic service, obviously, for that, because uh, initially we took in um, the game name, right? And now we uh, can take in both name, then it's going to be search, or ID, then it's going to be just straight up processing. So if it's a, we have ID, we just set ID and you know get the extended data right away. If we don't have ID, we search by name and only then do all the logic. So it's pretty straightforward. Right, uh, that's about it actually. So we can uh, meanwhile kill that path because we don't really need it. Uh, I, will, okay. I can I can do that later, That no, nonetheless. And then we have the user interface. Uh, so user interface is using Nux.js uh, or Nux.js. I'm not sure how exactly correctly to pronounce it. I assume Nux.js would be more correct because it's a view-based uh, framework. So um, it's very similar to Next.js. Um, and if you haven't used it, it's basically a very simple framework that ties in view, webpack, babel, and all that kind of stuff, including the view router, view X, uh, which is a storage option, uh, server rendering, meta information, whatever you can imagine. It's also very small. It's only 57 kilobytes of um, archive with gzip applied, right? So. The way it works is very similar to Next.js. You have your pages uh, folder where you can throw in stuff. So this is our uh, index page. If you are not familiar with Vue.js, uh, it has a more traditional, I guess, template-y way of creating components and pages. So in your uh, view script, you have three parts. First one is template, which is straight out HTML template with some view specific uh, properties like, for example, vModel, at key up enter. So this is key bind for uh, enter key up. And then you have the v4 and you know, key binds and so on and so forth. So this is, uh, in my opinion, this is the weakest part of uh, view and just about any framework that uh, f have its own templating language. Basically, you have to learn all those templates, you have to know how to correctly use them. Uh, because you know, every time I come back to view when I use it for uh, smaller projects, and uh, especially it's really good for one page projects when you can just throw in Vue.js as a script, 
without pre-compilation and .view files, you can just use it with one script tag and it's amazing for like some things. But I always have to go into reference and I always have to look how to do for loops, how to do mo model binding, how to do key press binding and all that stuff. And um, this, by the way, is an alias for vbind. I think uh, this in, in this case, we are binding property. So this can be done like this. But it's like they have like 25 ways of doing it. And it, it can be confusing. And you know, like this is one of the things that I don't like about templating frameworks. Right. So the next part is script. In this case, it's very straightforward. So uh, this is uh, how you do it for Nux.js essentially. You import the view itself and then you say, I, I don't even think we need to import view here, but basically you export the script, um, the component thing, right? So in this case, the view has the data property, which uh, is a function that returns a data object. And beware, it has to be a function because uh, another problem of you and Nuxt in general, that they don't really give you um, very good error messages. So I had some problems with figuring out what was the error when I did this. So I just did, you know, data is an object and you cannot do this. I'm not sure why. I guess because it wraps this uh, object into observers because it automatically absorbs all the changes on the state. But basically the error messages can be very obscure. So you have to be, you know, careful with how you do that. Okay, then we have a methods um, object that defines methods that can be called from the template. So in this case, we have this find game method that just takes the value from input, uh, sends the fetch request to our server, search URL, and just sets it to the um, these games, right? And then these games is rendered as a unordered list. That's about it. So very simple. Next part is we have the game page. In this case, you can see it's in folder game and under underscore ID. So uh, Nuxt.js actually supports um, sub roots. I think it's called dynamic roots. Yeah. So basically the thing is if you prefix anything by underscore, it will um, assume that's a slug, right? So it can be before some page, it can be after some address and so on and so forth. That's very useful. So if you use something like Next.js, for example, you have to implement this yourself. Within Nux, you can just create a folder structure and Nux will handle this for you, which is quite handy. And you can easily access those uh, slugs here. So in this case, uh, we have a page that is game slash then game ID. And this game ID is what we're getting here. Now, once again, template, very basic. So in this case, um, the template is twofold. Basically, once we check if there's a, if data status is not done, then we say, okay, game is still processing, come back later. If data status is done, uh, we and there are articles, we type in the game name, and then I created two simple visualizations. First one is a word cloud, and the other one is a score chart. Uh, word cloud obviously shows you the word cloud of all the keywords that were extracted, and score chart show, shows you the scores of the reviews and color the scores depending on uh, review uh, sentiment. So basically red for negative, uh, gray for neutral and blue for or green, I think for positive. So you know, quite simple. So in this case, um, script is a bit more complex. First of all, we have to import the isomorphic fetch because we do fetching of the data that can happen during the server rendering. Uh, that means we have to have fetch on a node and by default, it's not there. So we have to import the um, polyfill for it. Then we have view and async computed. This is a view extension that allows you to have uh, synchronously computed data. So the idea is that view actually has a field called computed, right? And here you can provide functions that will be uh, plugged into data. So in this case, you know, if I have a dynamic, say, uh, game info, right? I can say that this is going to be return uh, this game ID plus uh, this game name, right? For example, this is like very bad example. But anyway, so if there's some computed field, you can do this with Vue.js and it's integrated. It's really handy. Sometimes uh, like it can be very useful. The problem is you cannot do anything async. So it has to return the proper value. And async computed basically does exactly the same, but it allows you to return promises, right? So in this case, I just await fetch and uh, it works perfectly well. So basically, once we get the game ID, we just fetch the data. And then this this is this bit, I, I'm not sure if actually if it's a Nux.js or next year or Vue.js thing, I think it's a Nux.js thing, you have to provide the list of components here. 
uh, to render. So I think in view, you just basically import the components. So we import our components over here. And then um, in view, you would be to able to just simply render them because in view, you use the component registration. Um, wait a second, let me just quickly show you Increase size. So um, components, there we go. So in view, basically what you do is you globally say there is a view dot component, you name the component, and then you provide whatever options you might want, right? So and then you just use it as a tag within the view templates. Uh, Next requires you to pass on those components. And that actually took me some time to figure out because even if you don't pass them on, it seems to register them, but they are not completely rendered. So they don't render with logics, they just render as a dumb template. And that confused the hell out of me. So be careful with that. Right, so we provide those components, and then we can render them. Now let's talk about components. Um, components are pretty simple. So I use D3GS to render both word cloud and score chart. Uh, if you are not familiar with D3GS, it's uh, um, I wouldn't call it rendering library because that's not what it is. It's um, basically, yeah, manipulating documents based on data, right? So it's, it, it works mostly on SVG. And it allows you to do some crazy visualizations by because essentially, you're just rendering SVGs, right, depending on how the data looks. And uh, this is all all of those tiles are visualizations done with D3GS and all of them are well, way easier to do um, than, you know, if you would be doing it yourself. And then all of those have really good explanations and examples, how it looks, it even has like the loaders for JSON and stuff. So it's very powerful library that allows you to do a lot of things. It can be confusing at first, but uh, I'm going to walk you through the bits that we're doing here to show you what exactly happens. So in word cloud case, I'm using the D3 cloud plugin that um, handles the word cloud rendering. And uh, so here we have, uh, first of all, we define the color scale, uh, the way it works is that you give it a domain. So this is basically the size or the score of the um, I guess, yeah, I guess is in this case is the size of the word that we pass in. And depending on the size, we have uh, colors that basically gain intensity closer to the name. This is taken from the example of the D3 cloud. I haven't changed anything, you know, it's pretty simple. So uh, then we have the draw function, which will come back later. And then we have our component. So component takes data as properties. And once mounted, uh, here's what it does. So it takes the data, it filters articles that have keywords, key phrases, or extracted keywords, right? So we have to have some words to work with. Uh, then it maps the article to keywords. And it just assembles all of that into one nice array, right, that has keyword and score, because we want to score them and rate them uh, depending basically size them depending on the score. Then we reduce that to one array that has just you know, one uh, depth, because this way we'll have like three, three arrays, uh, array of three arrays, essentially one only one, then we filter out the short keywords, because as it turns out, there was some keywords, that was like one or two symbols long, or even three symbols with that are, you know, don't make a lot of sense. And then it turns out that the keyword extraction that we picked are actually not very useful. So I had to use the stop words, uh, I found the default stop words for English uh, on a web and essentially use them, you know, the stuff like who, whom, why, uh, that, that state and so on, and so forth, basically, the words that are not very helpful, and we filter them out, right. And we take this uh, array and map it to word map, which basically maps a word to a score, and we just sum all the scores because they're like, there's going to be a duplicates in those few extraction methods. So we do that, we calculate the scores for unique words, and then we take the top words, uh, top 50, actually, because uh, as it turns out, for example, for destiny Two, we had over 2000 keywords and rendering that in a word cloud is yeah, well, not very nice. So we take the top 50. And then we take this cloud layout, this is the d3 layout, uh, we say the size of it is going to be our config size, I believe it was 500 by 500. Uh, we say that the words is going to be the stop words, and we map them to a specific structure. So we say that there's text, there's size, uh, which is uh, basically a score plus 14. So we don't want to be the word be smaller than 14 in size. And this test, I don't even remember what is that, but uh, we don't actually need that here. <laughs> I should have looked through code a bit more carefully. We add padding, we say the padding between what should be at least five pixels, uh, we add rotation, which should be random, basically, it's 90 degrees, uh, random 
up to 180, I believe. Uh, font is impact, font size is gonna depend on the size here, basically, this is the size that we set. And then on the end, we do the draw function. And once it's done, we do layout start, that's it. So draw function is quite simple. It's setting the container, which is dot uh, hashtag work cloud. This is the only div we have here. It appends SVG to it. That has the width and height the same as the container, basically. Uh, it's append the G um, container, a G tag to SVG, which applies transform to it. So this translates the uh, size of it, I believe. And uh, then we select all text and append data to it. So the way, um, like, uh, it would be easier to actually just go and read the tutorial on D3 than explain all of that. So I'm just gonna link the D3 tutorial in description. But the way it works is it just takes the data, enters the text node. So this select all is required because if we rerun it, if we update it with new data, it will just update the existing stuff, not create the new one, right? Otherwise, it creates the new text, it sets the styles, it sets attributes, and then sets text for it. That's about all it does. So it's in this case, it's very straightforward. Uh, once I walk you through the score chart, I'm going to show you how exactly it works in the um, in the end, and I'm show you how how you actually run it yourself locally, right? Right. Okay. Score chart, uh, pure D3JS. So D3JS is very simple. <coughs> Excuse me. D3JS is very simple to run. Uh, Create, to create charts with, uh, so this is what we're gonna do here. It's gonna be um, 1,200 pixels wide and 500 pixels height, because there's actually a lot of reviews, for example, for Destiny. Again, properties, and when it mounted, we create the chart, which is D3GS, it just selects chart, so we don't even have any layouts or anything like this, we just purely do this. We create two scales, so D3 has a specific scale thing. Um, so Y scale is linear, the X scale is ordinal, we create the bounds, so bounds are our chart sizes essentially. We create two domains, uh, X has the domain from zero to the maximum score that we have, and uh, sorry, Y domain, and X domain is just the titles essentially. So, you know, that's like very simple. Um, then we create the, we we'll calculate the bar width, which is basically our width divided by the size of our data sets, very simple again. Then we create the bar uh, for each and every of those data things, right? So we select all Gs, we data, we enter, we append G if needed, and then we transform it basically to the size, which is basically a transformation, move it. That's not transform, let's move it. So we translate it to I multiplied by Y width, which means that it's gonna be moved um, number of pixels depending on its position, right? Then we append the rectangle. So this is what the bar will look like. We set the attribute of Y depending on score. We fill it uh, on color. So this color function is just basically, I should remove the console logs here as well. Takes in the sentiment, which is the string and it returns the color, which is red, green, or still blue for neutrals. And that's it. And then we set the height. Again, the height is calculated depending on uh, Y and a score and the overall height. And width is obviously bar width minus one to have some small padding. And then we append text, which is uh, x, y, uh, basically under the, to just show the score, right? I think it's not under, it's actually above it, because it's, yeah, it's y plus three, it's above the chart. That's about it, very simple, very straightforward. Uh, it might be confusing at first, again, when I started working with D3GS, I also had some problems, but um, it's actually a very simple tool once you figure out how exactly it works. Okay, so when you look at this folder structure, you go like, okay, how, how the hell do I run all of that on my machine? That seems like a lot of pain to start all of those services on your own, right? Well, fear not, we have a Docker Compose file that does all of that for you. So essentially there's a Docker Compose file that defines the how to build and how to execute all our services, storage services, input services, user-facing services, and supplementary services for you. Um, one quirk is that when you run it locally on a working machine, for example, my machine is not exactly super powerful. Um, what you might want to do is you might want to start Mongo and Rabbit first, right? Because there's a bunch of services that depend on them and want to connect to them immediately. And wait until they are actually spin up and then you just say up minus D. So they will start all of the other services. Um, Bear in mind, this does take a lot of resources to actually run. So if I uh, run docker stats, you're gonna see that 
Um, memory usage for some of those, I mean, okay, when they are in idle state, it's not that bad, but if you start running stuff through, for example, Fox, you're gonna get quite a lot of um, resource going, you know, especially RAM. So I guess this is Fox because it's still, it eh, whoops, was uh, not very good. So I guess this is Fox because it's still starting. There you go, it's already eating one gig of RAM and it's gonna be worse than that, basically. And Core NLP is also Java tool, so it's gonna eat quite a significant number of memory. Right, so once you start it, you can actually just go to browser and go to localhost 8018 and uh, you should see the UI. So once again, since this course is not focuses on creating nice UIs, we're focused on data processing and data science. I haven't really um, created any good UI, so you know it's gonna be very bare bones. But if we click on Destiny 2, so because we already have the data in the database right now, you're gonna see here's our word cloud. And here's our chart. Um, the chart is not complete. So as you can see, those are all blue, which means they don't have any sentiments. And uh, it might not have finished processing or there might be some issue with sentiment processing. No, I guess it's not the issue. It's more like this probably didn't process it, right? Because we didn't return anything. And this first reviews, even though they give very positive uh, reviews themselves, they for some reason have a negative sentiment to them, which is kind of curious. And I wanna run it through the whole thing again wait for all the sentiment processing to finish and actually see uh, what the correlation of sentiments and scores will be, which is kind of curious. Um, yeah, I guess that's that's about it. Let me stop the um, Docker Compose before it kills my computer it, because it, it does take quite a significant toll on you know running the whole thing and stopping it obviously also takes some time, but um, that's actually about all I had to say for this course. I hope you enjoyed the stuff. Um, it was pretty fun to do, so I don't know if I will keep working on that. I mean, I do think we can get some very interesting insights on games like this, but uh, obviously that would require a quite powerful infrastructure, quite a lot of processing time, and a lot of digging through the data and cleaning up the data later, as we've seen with the uh, keywords example, for example. Uh, but yeah, it was fun. I hope you had fun as well. Thank you for watching, as usual. I see you next time. Bye.